Okay, David, yesterday. David, check Apple, but you sound fine on the phone, just so, so you know through the video. All right. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is April 21st, 2022. Uh, welcome to the Plumbing Piping Work Examining Board meeting. Um, at, uh, it's approximately 9.05 a.m. I would ask, uh, we, we have a full, uh, we have a, a quorum today. Um, of members of the board. So this is a good meeting. And um, going forward, I'd like the um, board to review the minutes of the last meeting on January 27th of 2022. And I ask for um, any changes or a, uh, um, a motion to accept the minute at the last. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, December, uh, what month was it, November? January 27th, 2022, Chris. Make a motion to accept the uh, minutes of the I'll January meeting. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Chris has made the motion. Peter Alferi made the um, second. Do we have any further discussion? Are we all in favor? Uh, say aye. 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 Deny. Abstain. Okay. 6 0. -oh. Very good. Thank you, members. Okay, going on to our agenda for January 27th, 20, 2022 here. Um, we have um, some uh, a complaint report. Um, members of the board was sent yesterday. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, does, any, um, does anybody have any questions for um, Pamela or uh, Janita in reference to these? No, I just think they did a good job of uh, doing their homework and uh, taking care of these people that are violating the uh, codes. Looks like Thank there you, was some, Mr. Ballman. Um, looks like there were some fines here. Um, I believe uh, one uh, one or two fines of twenty five hundred dollars were shown here on the reports. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. In the first one, where it says the respondent is a Dave Steele, um, there's a correlating rep uh, complaint case for that, which is 2020-297, and it's in the 297 file where the $2,500 um, would appear in the column for the fine. So that file was closed earlier and this one, for whatever reason, wasn't closed at the same time. And it was just closed now, but they're both related and the $2,500 did go to Mr. Steele for the both files. Okay, great. Now the last one, the last item here, number five is a Henry Smith. Yes, sir. The, um, he had apprentices, uh, I, I see, is it, was that the one that had, it's very hard to, the writing's very small, I'm sorry. If, um, you, if you hit the plus sign at the top, sir, it will expand on the PDF I, so that you can read it better. Yes. Thanks, yeah, what I did, Janine, is I printed it out because um, oh, uh, we got to okay. get, the, I printed it out and I didn't, I read it this morning already um, on on my computer, but then when I printed it out for this meeting, it, it's smaller, so, uh, but that's okay. There was one, my only question was, was there this particular case, did this have numerous apprentices on the job that were not registered with the state, DOL? No, I okay. don't believe so. Um, this, this was a site inspection and, um, what the, what the final resolution notes and why the AVC and the forfeiture were there was for unsupervised, um, they were out of ratio <laughs> unsupervised apprentices means they were registered. It, okay. they just didn't have the journey person to apprentice ratio, which we all know on a job site is one-to-one. -one. And the allegations do not always 
fall, you know, anybody can make any allegation they want. It's during the investigation and the inspection because there was a site inspection that was done um, that th what is alleged is not necessarily what is found on the day that we're there or during the course of the investigation. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Gita, Janina in any of these cases here that she's shown? No, no, I don't have a question on this, Janita, but I, I do have one question. I just, I know, and I know there was I'm, a- I'm sorry, I'm, could you, is that Jay Moore? It is, yes, it is, Janita. Okay, I'm going by voice, I'm sorry, because I'm looking at, I have the report uh, form up in front of me. So um, is it related to this or do you want me to come back to the, to the regular meeting? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not related. It's not related to this particular list. No, it isn't. <clears throat> okay. Yes, sir. So if you want, if you, it, yeah, if it's something we could discuss at the, the regular meeting, sure. If you could pop back in. Yeah, no, I'm here. All right. Perfect. Um, your question, sir. Uh, well, it's, it's going to be, I know, I know it, there were some issues at, um, athletic brewing. I was just, uh, just curious. No, no, you could call me. You could email okay. me. Very good. No, that if it, it's an sure. open case. That's what my, that was case. my question. Still yes, open. It's so an, it's it, under the open. Yes, it's it's an open case. Yes, sir. It's okay. under investigation. Yes, sir. So that was my question. That's all, Janita. Other than okay. that, I'm good. Okay. Um, Janita, Chris Bowman. Sir. Question I have is lately advertising on TV by numerous utility companies and in their advertising that they do plumbing work inside, but they do not have any um, license numbers on their advertising or in the newspapers. Are they supposed to? When you say utility companies, you water mean like- Water company, um, Basically water companies. I've had three or four people call me because they know I'm on the board asking how they can get away with advertising without licenses, including billboards. Are you able to send us that information? This is Pamela Brown, Director of Investigations. So we can give you a gener generic answer, but our main interest and responsibility is enforcement. So we can have this information, that'll be great. If you can give us photos of billboards or whatever it is, ads on TV. Okay, I'll, just, uh, I'll reach back to those people and get them for you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll send them along. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I might um, have a couple of minutes to just throw something out there, sir. Please. Please, Janita. Um, to your board and your board's associations and memberships and everything else, the department went to a lot of trouble to create the um, anonymous complaint forms so that people could use them to file complaints, especially like if they're on a job site or, or whatever and they're looking for the anonymity. However, could you please go back to your associates and your members and stuff and say, if you file an anonymous complaint and you check in the box, you're anonymous, that means you don't exist, you're not anonymous. Please don't tell them, please don't put their email address or their phone number in the body of the complaint and say, can you email me or call me about this? Because that complaint, besides us doing a site inspection, is also going to go to the responding company and they're going to know who you are. So please don't put your name or your email address or your phone number and say, email me or call me about that. The other thing is if they don't wish to be anonymous and they're going to put their name as the complainant and they're going to file a complaint against the responding company, please make sure that you put the responding company as the respondent and you're not putting your name as the respondent and the complainant at the same time. So uh, 
The form says the first thing that should be put on there is who are you complaining about? That's the respondent. And then who's the complainant? And that's you. Unfortunately, lately, I've been seeing a number of complaints where the complainant has also put themselves as the respondent and the complaint center is sending me an email say, can you look at this? Who are they complaining about? Since they're complaining about themselves. So it's yeah, just- Yeah, good point. Uh, good point, Janita. Um, yeah. And Melissa's thinking, shaking her head laughing. It's, yeah. yes, it happens. You know, Bob Barrio at the heating meeting laughed out loud, but I'm just kind of putting it out there just so people know the anonymous complaint is there. It's a good tool, but just don't say, you, email you in, at this address or call me because now they're going to know it's you um, or to make sure that when you fill out the form that you put, it's, you know, XYZ company and that's who you're complaining about. Okay. For the record, Janita, I wasn't laughing at you or the subject. I'm just amazed at the stuff you have to tell people. No, no. I know you weren't laughing at me, <laughs> Melissa. It's because Bob Barrio said, you're kidding, right? And I said, Mr. Chairman, I wish I was, you know, so. And this probably just isn't plumbing. This is probably HVAC. This is electrical. Oh, yeah. This, oh, this is all, everybody. No. This is all the trade associations probably that take complaints yep. from their membership and, yep. and and send it through and it's completely not um, uh, put in properly. So, um, right. I no, it, you're yeah. right, sir. It is, it is for, it's for, it's across the board. It's not just plumbing. It's not just the HVAC. It's, it's everywhere. But um, I just figure if I put it out there, cause it just seems like lately it's just more and more. I don't know if people are rushing or what it is, but I just figure if I put it out there, it might make it easier. Well, and I think this would be a great um, adaptation or something even on our next round of continuing education for the industry to um, have um, have you or Pam put together something for uh, for particular the you know the plumbing CE um, I, we've just started the new round but and if, and I'll be honest with you if this is something that's uh, a major problem right now maybe we can as a board um, get this information to um, each provider as an addendum to their education package. Um, oh see a problem with that do, do you members it's of the board a, have mr chairman if i could please it's not a major problem at all it's just mm -hmm. that it's been in the past couple of months that it's happened more 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 than two or three times but i don't think it's necessary for the for the for the ce to change for that it's just that as people have a meeting with their with their with the different contractor associations you know it's just to, to mention it i don't think it's 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 that we have to change the scope of the ce at all yeah yeah okay um th thanks janita for uh for this um thanks for bringing it to our attention as well does um did you have anything else janita by the way i know you had a couple no, points you had them no up. sir i'm good thank you uh, mr chairman i have one more um i've Regarding uh, one of our inspectors, Jack Laduna retired, and I've got a couple of inquiries about replacing that position. So uh, the hiring, the posting is not out yet, but I do intend to replace that inspector position with someone from the plumbing, licensed plumbing trade industry. And once the job is posted, which will hopefully be very soon, we will do the outreach and send it out. Uh, so we usually will send our postings out to newspapers, LinkedIn, Indeed, and also the, the unions and anyone who else out there on our list that Janita and I can pull together. Thanks for that, Pam. Um, speaking of Jack Werdun, or, um, we're going to lose, we, we're losing a good guy. We're losing um, a, a, a wonderful industry man that's taking care of our industry, uh, not only in the field in the day, but uh, with the Department of Consumer Protection. Um, he is going to be missed. I had a chance to talk with him too and thank him from, uh, from the board and from me um, uh, for all the years of great service uh, that he did for our, uh, our industry. Thanks, Pam. Definitely an, ass definitely an asset for us too. So we're, we're going to uh, have a little bit of a delay there, getting everybody up and running, but 
No, we will bounce back. We will bounce back. But Jack's efforts, yes, definitely one of a kind. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Okay, under old business, we have a substitute house bill 6100 public act 2137. Um, so I know we're it's in the legislature right now. Um, and um, I know this is the last week of the session. So I'm sure um, um, the commissioner and Leslie are over at the Capitol as we speak working diligently on trying to complete um, uh, these, uh, these last minute uh, 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 bills and regulations um, out. Um, does anybody have any questions in the, in the uh, interim until uh, the uh, session ends next week uh, going forward? Okay, with none, we'll move on to uh, line number two, backflow prevention devices. Uh, discussion regarding licensure for backflow prevention devices. And um, I know that was, I don't know if there's anything other than some language that was out on that. Um, does anybody have any questions on backflow de prevention devices at this time? Having none, we'll move on to line three. Uh, I'm here, uh, excuse me, but that's the reason I'm here today. I wanna to address the board. Okay. Um, okay, David. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman Appleby. All right. Uh, members of the Plumbing Board, I'm, I'm Dave Waskowitz. I'm the Chairman of the Fire Protection Board, Licensing Board, and uh, I guess I'm here today to address you regarding this backflow issue. And uh, what it pertains to is the installation of backflow preventers on fire sprinkler systems. I'm gonna give you some background. A while back, it was brought to the board's attention by Richard Holbert that the state statutes actually state that the backflow in a fire system must be installed by a P license. And that's under section 20-330 of chapter 393. It's been a topic of discussion on, you know, on our board since mid 2020. Board asked for legislative change this, to the this statute to correct this, what I believe is a misassignment of work. I mean, I, it's kind of ludicrous that you'd have a whole complete fire system and then the backflow has to be installed by a P license. So uh, I was instructed to contact through the state, contact Chairman Appleby, you know, of your board, uh, which I did. and. Mr. Appleby wasn't very receptive and uh, I you know, just didn't want to move on it. Uh, then I was instructed by uh, Le you know, Leslie O'Brien, a legislative division of the DCP, won't, it, won't go for any change unless the board, plumbing board, is in agreement. So I guess that's why I'm here today uh, to present my case to you, you know, the board, rather than just the chairman get your opinion and uh i mean it makes no sense you know that this one component of the fire sprinkler system is um uh, has to be installed by a p license and i one thing i'd like you to consider i guess that you know the liability once this happens the liability or the onus of this backflow may be failing or not operating properly would become the responsibility to plumber, not the fire protection contractor. So, uh, it, I mean, just rest assured that our people are well trained on, you know, the installation, maintenance, testing, inspection, the backflows. Um, you know, it it's, it's gets into a licensing issue. And like I say, I just uh, asking the board to consider this, to agree to a change or to have this stricken from the state statutes. And uh, put it back, you know, that one component, the backflow back and could be installed by the F license. I mean, the board, our board worked diligently to create a new category license for the multi purpose system to more or less benefit the plumber. And I mean, this is 
Man. I'm not asking for you know tit for tat, but I mean you know like I say we 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 yeah. bent over backwards. We created that license yeah. category yeah. for residential, yeah. and uh, I just think there should be some due consideration to the fire protection board here in this case. So I'll present that to the board members and uh, ask for your consideration, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Dave, yes. you said this license or this verbiage went in in 2020? No, I, I don't know when it went in. Uh, I, I don't know who's asking the question. Is it, uh, Chris Bowman. Oh, Chris, Chris Bowman, okay. Uh, I don't know when it went. I mean, it, it was news to me when, when, you know, it's like bombshells get dropped on you. And, you know, it's it's a shock. And then, you know, you try to work through it and whatnot. This This... I don't, know, I don't know when it got instituted, Chris, to be honest with you. I didn't do any homework as far as that. Maybe Richard could have, would have an answer. Maybe it's been in there forever. I don't know. It just, it's just, it's odd to me that, I mean, I've been in the business for over 50 years. I mean, there's certain things we used to take for granted. I don't know, you know, we were explained and then all of a sudden we find out. I mean, it's the same thing with the, the five foot rule, bringing the underground into the building. We were always told it was five feet, and then you know, told no, it's this, you know, the the site worker, you know, the laborer with the P, you know, P seven license could bring the the service right into the building. I mean, it was I don't know, it was just something we were we believed to be true. Same thing with the backflow. I mean, I'm I'm retired now, but I mean, I put many a backflow in on a fire system. You know, I mean. Uh, because it, unbeknownst to me that this existed. So, I mean, I don't know if you, you get, you, you know, ladies and gentlemen even knew it existed, so. Well, David, uh, Chuck Appleby here. Um, the, um, I've always felt uh, that the backflow preventer was always belonged to the plumber because the plumber always protected the water source in, in the street or the house or whatever. Even in the case of a 13D residential sprinkler, yes, thank you for helping out getting that passed. The backflow preventer on a standalone system within a house is still the responsibility of the plumber in the home before it goes to a standalone, right? Is that correct? According to Richard Horbert, I guess, but I, it wasn't my you know, understanding in the 50 or so years, or I shouldn't say 50 years, but the uh, 44 so years we, I've been in the business. If we had to separate the potable water of a residential home with a backflow preventer, then why didn't the 13D, in, even though the manual says in the NFPA document, it's not a code book, but it's a document, but under P2304 in the ICC plumbing code, which allows residential sprinklers, why was the standalone systems then, why did we have to put the backflow prevention in there? Why wasn't the plumber still allowed to, to put in the standalone system, even though it says that in the document that it, we're actually testing for? Because you're not licensed for the standalone system. But the document says that you can do it. It's one of the um, um, pieces. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. I, I. I don't. You know. I don't even play one on TV. But I mean, I, I don't get into the law. All I'm saying to the plumbing board, I'm here today for one purpose: to explain the case, and hopefully you understand that it's. It's kind. Of, you know. It's kind of. Uh, you know. The, the state talks about being business friendly. It isn't business friendly when you say. Not a sprinkler contractor has to hire a plumbing contractor to install his device. It's, 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 it's you know, I, they got the device in there. The water is protected. I don't, you know, I mean, it, don't hang your hat on the fact that, you know, it's your duty to protect the, the, the potable water. We have the same obligation. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Chris Bowman. Chris Bowman. Um, Dave, have you and Chuck sat down with Leslie and discussed this at all? No. What, Chris? Let me explain. Like I say, it's been this been you know. First of all, these Zoom meetings are kind of a I don't know. I, I, I just 
I'm old school. I can't accept these Zoom meetings. I like the, the personal meetings or whatever. But it was brought to one of the meetings. The issue was brought up, and it's been ongoing back and forth. Finally, when it, you know it got to you know, I guess I said you know I sent an email to Leslie. You know we what what's going on? You, you know you're dragging your feet or whatever. It's like her advice to me was contact chairman of the plumbing board which I did and the conversation didn't go well. It was like, you know, it's like, you know, I hate to analyze something, but it was almost like, you know, Chuck dug his feet and said, no, we're not budging on this. And I said, okay, the conversation, you know, you don't want to move, you don't want to discuss it. No, nope. that conversation's over, bye. You know, and that was it. Okay. But Le Leslie will not do anything unless the plumbing board agrees to the change. So, I mean, I guess we're in a kind of a Mexican standoff here and I'm just trying to rectify a situation. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't know how I many- I understand, what you're, I understand what you're saying. I'm not trying to cut you short, but um, I'd like to table this and I'd like to discuss it with the board, give the board some time to think about this and bring it back to the next meeting. And maybe you and Mr. Appleby and Leslie can sit down in the meantime and try to iron this out. And I'd like to know, you know, I've been doing this 43 years myself and I know I tested on it. So I'd like to know when this is, if this was just put in or if it's a hundred years old, this, um, this uh, law. Okay. And I'd like to do a little more research on it before I make a decision. And I'm not going to speak for the board, but let them just make a decision. But I'd like to make a motion that this be tabled until the next meeting so we can uh, review this and then make a competitive decision or a competent decision on this. All right. I'd like to second that motion. Chris, um, we do have a couple. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. We have some discussion. Richard Herbert would like to come in to the discussion and Melissa as well. So I don't That's want to go without hearing uh, what they have to say. Can we start with you, Melissa? I agree with Chris. Um, and I, I think we need more information. And uh, I hear what you're saying, Dave. What I don't, as you know, I'm not a plumber. So what I don't want to have happen is it be a jurisdictional issue. I think it, we need to look at the history involved and... Uh, it does have to make sense for everybody and the safety of everybody. So uh, thanks, Chris, for bringing that up. I think we do need more information. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Chris, I mean, I'm sorry, Richard? Yeah, I mean, you have a document attached that uh, titled Backflow Prevention Device. And that was sent out when Karen sent out the invite. So if you have that in front of you, it explains what's going on. And as you can see, for irrigation contractors, um, their language and their definition says they can they can connect to a backflow pre prevention device. Um, and and the, the sprinkler board needs to have added to their definition that they can install and connect to a backflow prevention device. That's what they're looking for. So, um, Isn't that legislative, Richard? Well, it would be a law change, and Leslie O'Brien said that if the two boards or the two occupations can agree to add some language to the fire protection sprinkler system work definition, that it that it includes the installation and connection of backflow prevention devices, then then they would would be allowed to do it. You know. Um, I mean, the plumbing and piping work definition for licensed plumbers says that they have to do all water systems for human usage. So, so if it's human, if the water coming up to the premise is for human usage, then they have to provide uh, a backflow prevention device for it to go into something that's not going to be for human usage. You know whether it's for an irrigation system or whether the plumber has to install it for a, a sprinkler system. Okay. But I mean, I think you have to look at this from a little different angle. That 
sprinkler fitters are licensed and they're qualified by examination and apprenticeship programs, et cetera. So you're not dealing with a totally incompetent person. You're not, you're not giving the installation of a backflow prevention device to just some uh, basic person out there by when you change this law. You're giving it to someone that's already regulated, already licensed, already has gone through apprenticeship programs and already has some certain degree of competence. So, um, and that's what they're looking for. So that if they're there first and they, they install a backfold prevention device, then whenever the potable water comes to the premises, the plumber can do the connect to it. I don't know how, which, which always comes first. Obviously, if the sprinkler fitter wants to put it in, maybe because the sprinkler fitter is already on site and doing that portion first, you know? Maybe Dave can explain is, is that if that's what occurs. Melissa, your hand is still up. Are yeah, you... I, I did want to say something else. I did look at that sheet, uh, Richard, um, that talks, talks about 2019. There's nothing, like Chris says, there's nothing before that. But I'm glad you did bring up, because I did research this a little bit. Um, so to, to my board, I thought we talked about not having somebody licensed and just anybody who's installing a system come in. Um, and I, the way I read it is maybe we need a better definition of human consumption, but I agree that we're talking about making sure someone's licensed. So whoever gets there first, I know those of you that are plumbers are not gonna be happy with that. I don't think that uh, irrigation is for human consumption. So I would say no to the irrigation contractors that are licensed to that because we're talking about life safety and um, the safety of the water coming in. So the way I read it is, I don't know, maybe we need a better definition of human consumption because I don't think that irrigation is that, but I do think that fire protection is important. So um, well, I, I still find some conflicting information in the documents that I read. Okay, well, right. uh, Karen, the irrigate, you put up, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry, Richard, I was gonna have Karen put up a document for us if she could. Uh, right. That, so that uh, Melissa was talking about. So every, the other board members could see it as well. And David, you can chime in too. Uh, we'll let Richard finish up. I have two documents. I'm gonna start with this one. Um, there are actually three, but what you're referring to is one of these two. Um, so I'm just going to hit share for this one. You guys can let me know. <clears throat> okay, can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. Yep. Now I got it. Okay. So um there were two. One was in an email actually from Richard, and then there's this. So I will um, you know, I'll just leave it here and you can let me know if it if you want me to scroll down, if it's not large enough, whatever it may be. So so what I can say here, the irrigation people don't install a backbowl prevention device either. Their, their definition allows them to make a connection to it, but cannot install it. And the sprinkler fitters are looking to install and make connections to backbowl prevention devices. That's what they want to add to their definition. So either they install it initially or, or they, have, they make a connection to a pre-existing backbowl prevention device installed by a plumber. How many currently um, fire sprinkler licensed contractors have active plumbing licenses in the state of Connecticut? What's our ratios there? No. I don't know. We'd have to run another report, you know. What Were you asking how many have both the F1? Yeah, so like, you know, like David, David is asking, you know, you know, how many, how many, you know, he wants to have his, uh, his F1, F2 people install a backflow prevention device and maintain it into, into an, a system. So I know back in the mid to late eighties, I don't know, maybe it was the 87. I'm not sure. That no, the, it's April of 89. 89. Okay. Thanks Richard. April. So, yeah. 
April, sorry. Okay. So, so there was the sprinkler board was created from the plumbing board. So everybody, a number of more grandfathered. How many still exist today? How many plumbers, full, let's say, for instance, let's say F1s and F2s, how many exist with a plumbing license in Connecticut? I mean- Well, I think it's very few. And over the years, it's gonna be less and less and less because sprinkler fitters is, sprinkler fitter work is a trade unto itself. And, and most people don't pay for multiple licenses unless they have to. And even though we grandfathered everybody in April of 89, uh, within a five year period, probably 80% of the plumbers who were grandfathered the F1 or F2 license um, dropped the license because they didn't really do sprinkler work. They just thought it was a quick gimme and, uh, and then they dropped it. So, um, so I mean, I, and I think as time goes on, you, you, you're just gonna have less and less people that have a plumbing and a sprinkler license. I have the numbers so, if I, you were looking for that. Sorry well, about it's that. really relevant, but, and, and this past year's renewal, I don't know what the numbers would be. Do you have some, Karen? Yeah, I do. I, I ran a report yesterday and the number of people that have the F2 and the P2 is 74 licensees and number of people that have the F1 and P1 is 280. Oh, so not, so too, not, not too many, only 74 contractors might have both licenses. And, uh, well, 200, the contractors, the F1 and the P1 is 280. The journey persons that hold the F1 and the P2 is 74. So that's 10%, I'm just guessing what our P1s are. How many P1s do we have in the state of Connecticut? Around 2,800, uh, I don't know, what's the number on the P1s themselves? So the, the number, let me just pull that up. Let me just, just wonder what the percentages <laughs> are, you know? <laughs> the number of, so the number of, um, David, the you're active, up, followed by Vinny. The number, of, the number of active F1s is 406. Active F2s is 659. Active P1s is 2612. And active P2s is 2057. What was the F1 number? Um, 406. Okay. And we have active, so combination F1P1s, we have 280. Uh, David, could we, um, I, uh, we can hear from you, David, a sprinkler chairman. I'm here. Yeah, you had your hand up, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I mean, there's two key things. I, I, is I, I'm listening here, observing. The key word there was human usage. Fire water is not human usage. And the other thing is the document that Karen posted up was was kind of, news to me you gotta you keep in mind again with these zoom meetings and the fact that we meet every three months <laughs> the date on that was 2020 that's that's very coincidentally right around the time this issue popped up it, it, it almost looks like somebody instituted a change around that time because i i was never aware of that maybe you know director Holbrook could have an answer to that but like i said I Go ahead. This, this document was created because a question was raised can a sprinkler fitter install a back pole prevention device. And that's when I created this document in 2020 to, to put, put in it the sections of the law that pertains to what we're talking about. That was when the issue originated, when some building official or somebody says, can a sprinkler fitter install a back pole prevention device? And then because it's because the water up to that backflow prevention device is water system for human usage, it falls under their plumbing and piping work definition. So so you you arbitrarily made this change. Or is there is, I didn't level? make any change. It, you, it's just, you it's, it's, the language, the language I'm all I'm asking. No, the definition of plumbing pipe pipe and work that you have on this document that Karen is sharing is the way it is in the statute. And it was prior to this 2020 document I created. I just cut and paste out of the statute. All right. And it's it's up to that back pole prevention device, it is water for human usage. And the back pole prevention device is to make a break point 
And then on the sprinkler side, obviously that could be contaminated water or what have you. Just like the irrigation people can, can make a connection to a, a pre-existing backflow prevention device. It just says in the regs. And it, the bottom line is the, the, the definition of fire protection sprinkler work, you want a little language added where, where the, the sprinkler fitter can install a backflow prevention device associated to sprinkler systems or make a connection to such if it's pre existent. Well, I, I appreciate that. And all I want to say to the, the plumbing board is I, I know your time is valuable. I know you don't like sitting through a long meeting. I presented my case. I thank you for considering it. I, it's unfortunate that it's going to take at least three months till we hear something or there's a, you know, the research is done, but I appreciate the time <laughs> you're listening to me and hopefully, you know, we, we correct this situation and, and, you know, go from there. Uh, like I say, it just, it doesn't make sense to me. That's all. So, uh, I mean, if you had any other questions, I would answer them, but the human usage is, is the key word there. The fire water is not human, you know, for human usage. The, the sprinkler fitter is licensed by the state of Connecticut. He's competent. I, I see no reason to make, you know, to have implement, or I don't say implement, but enforce this rule that all of a sudden appeared out of the blue that nobody nobody was aware of. I don't know. And I'll ask the board, how many people on the board knew it existed? You know, it's, it, it, I didn't, so... You know, I guess I'm not pleading ignorance, but so I, I, I presented my, uh, you know, case to you. Thank you for the consideration and, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Hey, David, David, hang on a second. Uh, something you would like to say, Vinny Valenti. Uh, Vinny, please. Good morning and, and good morning, Dave, Vin Valenti. Hi, Vinny. Um, I understand what you're saying, and, and I know your, your craft is, is competent in mechanical installations. Um, I, I will say, uh, you know, I'm hearing statistic that, you know, about 70%, 60 to 70% of the F1s have P1, so they're allowed to do it. But, you know, the other thing is, I can't stress enough the importance of that point of contact between the potable water system and any other water system, be it irrigation with chemicals, uh, sprinkler pipe with, with iron in it, uh, chemical factories, restaurants. The, the, the backflow preventer is one of the, the most critical components in a plumbing system, perhaps the most. And, and uh, I would hang my hat on that. And, um, I'm not one to really budge from that one bit as, as a plumber for 30 years. And it's with great and due respect for a man that I've known for that long and respect and admire. But Dave, honest to God, uh, that is the most critical component in a plumbing system. And I'm just putting that out there. But that's what my thinking thought is. Thank you, Vinny. David, your hand is still up. Do you have? I don't know. I, I don't see a thing to remove it, Chuck. I don't, okay, anyway, I got it. There we go. Okay. All right. You know, but, but like I say, I, did, I don't want to belabor the point. Hopefully, you know, uh, you know, you take it under advisement. You know, it, correct. To, you know, we can correct this. You know, and work together on this because, like I say, it's it's. You know, I, I was kind of hoping there'd be other members of my board here. I, you know, but. To voice their opinions. I had one letter that you know from a contractor member, but I you know, I'm not going to read it into the minutes or anything. But I, again, I thank everybody for your your time and your consideration. And you all have a good day. Stay healthy. Stay safe. David, hang on. We have one more document that we could probably put up for you. Karen, do we have a, an extra document that has not been shown? Um, obviously, if you didn't see the other one, I'd like to share this one with you, so at least you could see it. I'm not sure what it is as well, but um, I think it, if it's pertinent. Yes, there, there is one more. I can just put it up. Thank you, Karen. Um, 
there's an email from Richard um, where, let me just get it on the screen. It just provides a background of, of what's been going on with this. Okay. Give me one second. Karen, if you could, this is Dave Waskowitz, if you could yep. e email me those documents, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I was going to say all of these have gone before, these, none of these are anything new. They've all gone before your board, but I, I will do that. Um, let me just, this should be, okay. Yeah, this this document does say when the, when the question was raised by John Abate on December 5th, 2019. Yeah, provides, Leslie O'Brien. Yeah, so yeah. I'll just scroll through here um give me a few minutes and then i'll scroll down um these were the two documents that do provide background of what's been going on with this so let me know if you want me to go you can stop right there karen okay thank you thank you does everybody on the board have a chance to see this david do you see this as well yes 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 <clears throat> I know David is on his phone, so I don't know if he can see it. Yes. Yeah, I remember that meeting well. Okay. That's, you know, I mean, it's, but that, that wasn't, we moved down a little we're, 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 we're mixing metaphors here. That was on the, you know, inspection, you know, testing. It wasn't on the installation, Chuck. You know, that's, you know, I mean, this. No, this, I'm, I'm just seeing it for myself right now, David, for the first time. So I'm reading it um, right now as we speak, just so you know. No, no, I'm just one more page to it, so you can let me know. Okay, hold on, Karen. I'd like to finish. Yep. The part. That will be Chris Bowman. I have a question on this. Okay, go ahead, Chris. This was the fire sprinkler board, their yes. March fifth meeting. Yes. I am reading that correctly. Yep. Dave, uh, yes, so your board, your board met in March, and you wanted a legislative change. Did you ever uh, submit for legislative change or provide a legislative change to well, we, the uh, state? We talked to Leslie O'Brien. We waited. You know, again, it was finally it was it came to the point where again it was not not in person. An email was sent, and she wrote back and said, "Well, I, you've got to get together with the plumbing board." You know, so so that that's that would institute. I don't remember the exact date I called Chuck, but it was a while back. You know, and it, this is this has been going on for a while. But like I say, the the initial this this whole issue rose from John Abate asking about the inspection, not installation. So somehow this got uh, enlarged or you know it encompassed something more than the original question. Well, I think I think it's pretty clear that probably he brought up the question about backflow prevention devices and and like he said, probably about in, in testing and inspection, and that's a Department of Public Health license. And I'm sure I said yes, the licensed plumber installs it, and then you got to go to DPH to get your testing and inspection credential. That is correct, Richard. That's what you do. So, you know, that's how it, that it got brought up. Well, there's many sprinkler fitters. My, so I, 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 mine has since lapsed. We're certified in, in testing backflows. You know, it, it, and, you know, and I think that's, John Abate has since retired, but at the time he was, he was employed as a, you know, you know, with a contractor's license. And I think he raised the issue as to you know who could test those those devices. So right. I mean, say all of a sudden this appeared, you know, that the, the, the plumber had to install it. So you know that's why I say it's been an ongoing issue going back and forth. Again, I, I don't devote full time to this, you know, you know <laughs> being on the board's a part-time job as you all well know and it's a voluntary job. But uh, uh, 
like I say, I'm trying to do my best. I was instructed to come to, you know, you know, contact you or contact Karen and come before your board at the next meeting. So that's what I'm doing. Again, I don't want to belabor the point. You know, I don't want to, you know, keep going on beating the dead horse, but I'm just asking you guys, you, or you, you people, I shouldn't say guys, ladies and gentlemen, you made a motion, you know, you're going to table it and consider it. You know, I guess I can't ask for any more. We have a motion um, on the floor from Chris and a second from Peter to table this to our next uh, scheduled board meeting, which is David as well, July 28th, 2022, 9 a.m. And, and do we have a all in favor of um, the date set for the 28th to get back to uh, Chairman Waskowitz? Say aye. 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 Any discussion? Any abstains? Okay, six to nothing vote, so moved. Thank you, David, we'll see you in uh, July. Thank you, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you for appearing. Thank you. Okay. Okay, number three, continued review of out-of-state occupational trade licenses for determination of Connecticut occupational trade licenses. Um, the working group meetings are um, very active. A lot of licenses are um, um, coming in front of us and the department is uh, looking at trying to um, uh, streamline it uh, a little differently. So we're still working on that type of streamline uh, uh, options. Um, both, um, um, I know I spoke with the chairman of the electrical board as well. Um, he has his uh, um, agendas as well as much as we do here at the plumbing board. So um, we're still working on that. We'll be uh, meeting with the um, um, commissioner um, next week for an MOU meeting for our um, uh, quarterly or every six months for once a year uh, MOU meeting uh, with commissioner Siegel. Um, and we can take it from there, but we are actively meeting every month. Uh, Todd Birch from Department of Labor, Richard Herbert, myself, and and I believe Janita sits in on that as well. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, Paul let um, Ann in as well at times. Um, um, that's that one. Um, off to um, um. Do we need a vote, Karen, on um, the, uh, it was determined what the following license, so the equivalency for Rhode Island um, license was equivalent to the Connecticut. I think we had mentioned that, right, or something? Well, these are, these are the ones um, that have been discussed at the working groups and, and, and the, the procedure is, or what, what the department is looking to put into place is that when we, um, either when we approve a license for this particular reason, a particular license, that this be put on a list so that the full board can review and weigh in as far as whether they agree, they agree these licenses are equivalent or not. Um, and the goal is for them to be approved, put on a list so that going forward, um, the department can prove just based on this list. Um, Right. So, so we're so th theoretically we are looking for a not theoretically we're looking for the board to vote as far as whether they feel these licenses are equivalent or not. Okay, Vinny, you got your hand up. Yeah, I'm, I'm just you know I've been aware of this process as it's going, and um, again I have deep concerns, you know, because it, the way it's unfolding is. I don't need to sit through the process of getting a Connecticut P2. I can just go to Westchester County where New York has barely an apprenticeship system, sit for an out-of-state license, and I'm gonna be allowed to work equivalent to a P2 in the state of Connecticut. And it, it, just, it just troubles me to, 
I'm, I'm sorry, but th this is just a, like an end run and, and actually doing a bona fide process. Why, why go through the state of Connecticut processes? I don't have to listen to these laws. I'll just follow the laws of some other state, whether they're easy or not. I don't necessarily understand how short a time there could have been a crosswalk or a matrix saying that these are equivalent to what we do here and, and what we require of the folks that live and work here. So, and I don't see anything here that indicates that these are reciprocal, meaning that, okay, if we accept these licenses, the sister state will accept ours, one for one. It's, it's, we're, we're just acquiescing and getting nothing in return and probably gonna get a substandard product coming in state, taking work from citizens here. Sorry. Thank you, Vinny. Um, Melissa. You're next. Uh, Chris had his hand up next. So go, All right, ahead, go ahead, Melissa. I, I just want to say I completely agree with Vinny. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. This makes no sense at all. It's just legislators not understanding the whole process. So thank you for saying that, Vinny. I totally agree. Hey, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's you. You, uh, you I'm got, up. Uh, okay. Um, a couple questions. I guess Vinny answers one that they don't have the same apprenticeship program that we have as far as the hours. And if we do give them the license, what are they gonna do about CEUs? Are they gonna sit for CEUs? And are they going, what happens uh, with the P, with our P1s and their master license? Is it now just gonna be all they gonna they can apply for Connecticut's master license and be granted without the continuing ed. And do they know they have to stay, they have to serve work for some company that has a P1 in the state of Connecticut so that in two years now, they're going to come and ask to take the test for the P1 of Connecticut without the proper apprenticeship program or the pop uh, training programs. Has that been discussed? Right, right, Chris. Uh, Jay. No, has it been? Is there an answer? No, no there's, well, there's been talk of comparison between Todd Richard and myself during these meetings with Paul Ed Annan um, in discussion of what they bring to like if somebody applies from New York, they give us all their education and credentials that they have in letters of recommendations and years of experience and stuff like that. And if they've been classroom um, related instruction prior to applying for Connecticut um, from, from their state, you know? So th th that is in the discussions all the time, yes. Richard. Well, Jay's first there. No, Jay. No. Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate, I agree 100% with Vinny and Melissa. Uh, I think it's a disservice to the people who carry a plumbing license in the state of Connecticut, who sat and did the, who put through the effort to go through the apprenticeship here, who trained and, and earned it. Um, it is not reciprocal. Am I allowed to go to Westchester and Putnam County? And, and with my license, it's not reciprocal. That word reciprocal is not appropriate for this. It's a one-way street. I disagree wholeheartedly, 100%. Thanks, Jake. Richard. Uh, well, just for a couple little clarification, the word reciprocal kind of can come up, can mean a lot of different things or different scenarios of how things are reciprocal. So um, I'm trying to turn up my hand because it's annoying me. There we go. Um, what I want to say is um, these persons, when the board weighs out the experience and training of a person from out of state, that, that, and they happen to have also have a credential from another jurisdiction. That's when the working group may or may not approve a person. It's not, um, and it just seems predominantly the Westchester, I believe the Putnam, and then the Rhode Island license types are very, very similar to get an RP2 from, from the working group meetings that have been held. Um, so, so as you, it was explained, the reason why we want the full board to agree to these three licenses from these three different jurisdictions is so that in-house we could just approve a Rhode Island licensed plumber to set for our P2 exam. 
everybody still has to sit for our exam. So, and as far as any form of reciprocity, I mean, that's, that we do have that in our licensing law language to enter into agreements with other jurisdictions who will do the same, who will issue our, issue us their license if we issue them our license, but that's without examination. So, uh, and we're not, we're not doing that. I mean, we're, we're not talking about that scenario. So uh, as far as continuing education, once a person does acquire a Connecticut license, they do have to take continuing education, whether they're from out of state or not. Um, there's no exemptions to that. So in order to maintain a, a valid Connecticut license, you have to pay the renewal fee and have proof of continuing education as required. So that's not really an issue here. Um, or out of state people because they do have to take the CE if they get a Connecticut license. I don't know if that was all the questions, but or answers, but Peter, you got a question? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've sent maybe 40 or 50 guys up to Boston this past year to go to work. And something's happening behind the scenes because when our guys went to Boston, they had to go fill out the application for the license. So whether they got approved on their side, but this was kind of like almost like a direct entry to maintain work, maintain our membership working while work was slow in Connecticut. And I just want to make that a point. Something could possibly be happening behind the scenes that we don't know about whether the Massachusetts State, State of Massachusetts Board is allowing this to happen or whether the, the local itself up there is letting this happen, but they're filling out applications to take the test. Um, in my own opinion, I, I don't have a problem with that if we do the same for them, for Massachusetts, Rhode Island, for New England, for New England area, I know it's, it seems like a scam, but if we're all here to help each other out, that's the name of the game. I'm not saying to take somebody from the deep South where they have no apprenticeship and no license and just scam them through a sham, you know, but these guys have apprenticeships. They have apprenticeships, they have programs, their license is very difficult to get. And just for the fact of getting our guys just handed the application process prior to going to work, I think that's a win. Something's happening there and it's happening to a good thing. For, for us, for a local that is statewide, has thousands of members, and sometimes we can't find jobs for each and every member. So getting them a job in Boston sure is a lot better than sending them out to Oregon. That's just my opinion. Just wanted to make that a state, you know, let you guys think about that. Thank you, Peter. Melissa. Hey, that's an interesting point. It's good to know that other states are, are going through that process. I didn't know that. Um, my concern is always, uh, and Chuck and Richard, thank you for clarifying that people are going, that you're reviewing this for similar education and things like that. I would find that they're from New York, probably very few that meet that criteria. And I'd be curious to see how many you've seen so far, because as we've talked about for years, New York doesn't have a training, a formal training program. So just because someone's a plumber for 20 years, that guy might've only done one thing for 20 years. Sure. So that doesn't mean that they've gone through all the criteria that we have. So that's my big concern. And the reciprocity obviously just makes sense. And I'm glad that see that would be in the legislation. But um, how many people have you seen from the from New York that actually meet our educational criteria? That's interesting to me since they don't do it. Well, that's just it. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, so on that issue, New York doesn't have a statewide licensing program for, for electrical or a plumbing or heat and cooling or what have you. New York State does have New York State apprenticeship training programs for all the trades, but it's not mandatory to get registered as an apprentice. So, so certain companies do set up a state apprenticeship program and they, they follow the education and, and training outlines, but the majority do not. And in New York State, there's only been 
I mean, there's the town of Mount Vernon. I, I don't think we've approved that license type. There's there's Cobosquel. We didn't approve that license type, right? There is some county licensing, county-wide licensing. There's town licensing. There's village licensing. So it was Putnam County and Westchester County licensing for plumbing that we thought was equivalent upon reading the laws and regulations from those jurisdictions and as people applied. So, you know, that's that's what we've been doing. Obviously, the Rhode Island one is a statewide plumbing journey person license, and we thought that criteria was equivalent to ours. Likewise, for the Massachusetts plumber um, licensing system, that's a statewide program. So, you know, there's a lot of variables, a lot of things to look at in these working groups. And it wasn't until we reviewed, these working groups have been going on for quite a while. It wasn't until we reviewed a lot of applicants from these different jurisdictions that we started to see where, you know, some of them seem to be equivalent to ours. And again, they still have to take our licensing examination. Right. And our, our licensing examination is not real, it's not a gimme. I mean, you know, so most or all of you or some of you have been to to the application to the examination review work groups with the PSI test developer where we pick and choose what answers and questions are on each um, area of the exam, the numerous content areas of the exams. So, you know, we're just trying to make things a little bit easier. But that's about, that's all I have to say right now. Um, Jay Moore. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on what I said prior. So do, do New York states, like to, to what Richard said, don't really have a bona fide apprenticeship program. Rhode Island does, Massachusetts does. I mean, those, and, and there is reciprocity there. We're allowed to go there and take the test for the license. So, you, you know, so the states that do meet our criteria and allow us to go get a license in their state is, is, is probably acceptable. But, but as, as far as New York goes, I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't agree with the New York uh, counties and state. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Vinny. Vinny's still on mute. Yep, there I got a button now. Gotcha. You. Um, you know, my, my experience, I've held master fitter, plumber, refrigeration license in neighboring states. Uh, particularly in Rhode Island. Um, I've seen more often than not when someone in just individually applies from a license in other states, uh, they end up in the circular file right off the bat. They don't make it easy. You know what, you know, and, and I'm, try I'm trying to hear a clarification is, you know, I'm hearing Richard say that no one will be able to get a license here in the state of Connecticut under any circumstance without sitting for the exam. Is that true? Oh, I'm on. You hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Every one of these applicants still has to take the state examination. We don't, we're not, the reciprocity without examination language requires an agreement between two different jurisdictions, Connecticut and another, whether it's county, town, city, or a statewide licensing jurisdiction. And we're, we're not, we're not using that law right now. We're not addressing that law in these working groups. Right. These, well, the working other... groups these working groups are strictly, what do you have for education and what do you have for hands-on experience? And are there any applicable licenses that you hold in other jurisdictions that we can look at? And what's the requirements to obtain such license credentials? And, and that's how we weigh out these applicants, whether they can sit for our exam or not. Another thing is this, this has always traditionally been a function of the plumbing board. And now we have, we have a, a work committee, you know, of which only one member of the plumbing board is on. So I don't understand why these applicants aren't still coming before the plumbing board for review with a larger okay. group of people with more combined expertise, because we can tell 
orange from green rather easily. You know, we sit down with somebody that wants to take a license. It takes us about 10 minutes to understand if they're a competent mechanic or not. This um, is kind of a boilerplate system. And the other thing, you the partner, which I'll bring up at the, at the closing, our partner in this examination approval process, PSI exams, is an absolute mess. They can't even get the people that are here in Connecticut approved properly. I sat with six people in the last month that they mess up their social security numbers. They can't get approved. They sit for months and months, unable to take their exam and losing thousands of dollars in wages and benefits. So if PSI exams is part of this process, that's reason enough not to continue one minute longer. Thanks, Vinny. Uh, Chris Bowman next. Question I have, uh, Putnam County and Westchester County, what are their apprenticeship hours? What, are they, what do they require for their schooling hours and what do they require for their on-the-job hours before they can sit for their own exam? Richard, do you have that answer? Well, yeah, we have collected the different laws from different jurisdictions and we don't have that with us today. And so what we'd have to get that for you. If you want to okay. see. What, what I would like to see, I would like to see, and I imagine the board members would like to see what the hours are that they do for their apprenticeship training, what they do for their schooling and what they do for their on their job before they're allowed to take their own licenses. Okay, so for the three credentials, from the three different jurisdictions that care. I don't care about Rhode Island. I know I know Rhode Island. I care okay. about New York. The two in New York. I don't care so about Rhode you, Island because I know Rhode Island is part, right. is the same as Massachusetts. All right. So if, if you want to approve the Rhode Island to be one the board will would want the department to map be approved, then we could do that today. And the other two will get you further documentation on the laws and and pertaining to how to obtain the Westchester and Putnam County licenses. And what their hours are for sitting, what their hours are for training for schooling and on the job. Like we have to have so many hours of schooling and so many hours of on the job. That's Westchester County and Putnam, Chris? Yes. That's all that I have. Okay. Um, Pamela Brown. I heard it said, uh, but was one of the questions raised is why doesn't the board have the full authority to approve license? And I just wanted to remind everyone of the North Carolina Dental Supreme Court case, which uh, was passed many years ago. And this is why we have the working groups for which we have one representative from the board one from DCP and also a representative from DOL reviewing these applications. So it was to prevent, North Carolina Dental was to prevent active market participants from blocking individuals from getting licenses. And like I heard comment earlier about, well, these people are coming from out of state. Uh, they're taking jobs from, from people in Connecticut. That could lean on the anti antitrust. And so that's the reason why North Carolina Dental was put into put place. So nothing further than that. Just wanted to, to bring that up. Thanks, Pam. Uh, Aaron, did you have your, uh, yeah, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, go ahead, Aaron. I just wanted to reiterate, and uh, I'm, I'm getting numerous complaints from members and uh, also from, um, contractors trying to uh, get their testing done, uh, coming in from out of state, uh, having a terrible time with PSI, losing data, losing applications, losing social security numbers over and over. It's going on for months and months and months um, in the well drilling and pump installation industry in Connecticut, we are in the midst of um, a crisis. If you look uh, out forward a few years, we're in big, big trouble to have anybody to do any work here. 
uh, and and anything to to dissuade uh, you know uh, contractors from applying from out of state. Um, granted, uh, we don't want to give work away to other people out of state, but if they're young contractors that are interested in the industry and want to do this right, uh, we're trying to foster their uh, abilities any way we can. Uh, and I'm I'm starting to work on some some things with with our association because uh, I just had another one come to me. Uh, he's actually somebody that subcontracts for me from New York State, um, and it, it, it's just been a terrible situation for for them and process. So I just want to throw that out there in the fray because um, of 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 uh, you know. Of the industries here in Connecticut, the, the, the water uh, water well industry is, is kind of important, and uh, we need to see what we can do to help people get licensed properly. Thanks, Aaron. You know, the fact that you and Vinny are bringing this up, I had a case a couple weeks ago with a guy that put his application in four or five months ago, and he was never notified that he was approved and that PSI never reached out to him. There's got to be a problem here. So i am tell you what, between what Vinny's saying, what you're saying, and with your members, and what this individual went through, uh, we really need to uh, find out what is going on at PSI. Um, who do we have in the department who directly would deal with PSI to find out why they're um, tripping this up? This is ridiculous. Vinny said it. Look at, you, you said four or five months. I know one individual. And it's a heating license, not a plumbing license, but he he's lost four months. He can't get a pay raise, substantial pay raise and a benefit package. And to go to work for a company that wants him because he was just never notified and he was scared to ask. He just thought it was part of the system. I always told people it's 45 days typically from the time you send an application. And by the time the department turns it over uh, and PSI is involved, and then you get your approval letter. Um, who, Richard, do I go to or Pam to get this straightened out? Because this is sounds like a wide problem now. And it's probably not just at the plumbing board. It's probably all the boards are having this problem. Wouldn't you think, Vinny? Wouldn't you think this would be across the board? Uh, Vinny, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Now, Vinny, you got to unmute, please. You know, I thought I hit the other button. Okay, Vinny, so, go ahead. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that in a second. I just want to clarify, too, to what Pamela said. I understand about the dental case and the necessity for the mechanisms that are in place um, to insulate the board, you know, or insulate the state from, from litigation. Um, I'm, I'm just, my major concern is that the high quality that we have here will never be diluted. I already said it was a personal caveat. I lived out of state for 15 years and worked in Connecticut, but was properly licensed and went through a bona fide program. You know, and, and what Chris was saying, Rhode Island's is pretty much almost a one for one thing. I, I you know, almost think the laws are written on the same day. These counties, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little harder to understand exactly what they're doing and also have no assurance that people aren't getting into other licensing systems by virtue of having their boss write a letter, say, hey, this, this is a good guy or gal, and they worked for me for 10 years, and they're just an awesome mechanic. So, I, you know, give them, a, give them a license in Vermont. You know, I'm not, I'm not even want to pick on our sister states. Um, and what Pete said about, you know, when, when there's a need to move regionally, and with most of our contractors, small commercial and above, move regionally. New England's not a big place. So the tri-state area, throw New York in there. Through, you know, yeah, there's a lot of movement of mechanics and commerce. No one's, no one's trying to be um, shuttering the borders. We just want to make sure that folks that are working here are competent. And the folks that are contracting here, they're doing business here, have a fair shot. Uh, addressing what Chuck said, I'm talking about tens of thousands of dollars in lost wages and benefits due to the incompetency of PSI. They are absolutely losing people's personally identifiable information. They do not send a mail notice. They do not send an email notice when a person's approved. 
I've sat here in my office with really six people in the last month. You call them up. Oh, we can't find your social security number. Tell me your phone number. Oh, we found you. Okay. Now what? Well, we're going to eradicate all your data. You start over. Go ahead. Or please send me a picture of your driver's license. And why would you send your driver's license or any kind of important data to these people that are absolutely incompetent? When you call there, it's a boiler room operation. You can hear 50 other people in the background. Um, I don't think we should be engaging with PSI anymore. I believe we should find another contractor. They, they have done more damage than they could ever repair. There's nothing they could do to make this better. They need to be removed as a service. Because I'm, you're talking, you add it up, people not being able to get their license or make their wage progressions, you know, remaining as apprentices beyond their legally allowed time because of their incompetence, you're pushing hundreds of thousands of dollars easily. Melissa. I have the same concerns about PSI. So my question is to the DCP. Um, there have been complaints about PSI for years. I don't have personal experience with it, but I've heard from our association as well, the same type of thing. So I was wondering to the DCP, is there a process to go out to bid to consider moving and making sure that the whoever makes the decision on PSI is doing their due diligence? Because this has been years of complaints and I agree with what Vinny and the others are saying. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Pam Brown wants to uh, add, uh, add in. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, I just wanted to address the uh, PSI topic as a question is on the floor. Uh, within the last week or so, DCP has received complaints uh, regarding PSI from applicants, and it is being addressed by our direct director of operations. And so that's not at my level, that's on the, you know, more of the commissioner's level, but if Chuck, if you wanna bring these concerns to meeting on Monday, you know, I'll see if it can be added to the agenda for the MOU meeting. Okay, our meeting, yeah, that's a week from Monday. A week from, yes, the fifth. Right, fourth, right, sorry, so yes. um, yeah, if you guys have any internal meetings um, with the commissioner and Leslie and other agency officials, uh, if you could, bring this up as well in your um, weekly or daily, uh, Pam, if you wouldn't mind, because I just thought it was, I just heard it once, things fall through the cracks, but now hearing this, this seems like to be a serious problem. And, and the fact that these young people that we're trying to put to work, work so hard to go through an apprenticeship in Connecticut is being held back. It's, it's, it's terrible. Um, if you could please share this, um, Pam, um, when you can. Please. Sure. And if you have anyone who is personally experiencing a problem, please let us know. They should reach out. I mean, I have my email. I'll forward an email on, but it's licensing services. Oh, they should be emailing. If they're, they do have a problem, you know, please tell them so they have to notify us so that we can help them in, as individuals. We're trying to fix the problem as a whole, but if they can just come forward, then we can see what we can do for them. Thanks, Pam. Okay. Uh, but you will bring us up in your meetings with the. Um, yes, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, Jay Moore, please. Yeah, I just want to say I'm sorry, but I, I have an in person meeting I have to get to very shortly. So uh, is there anything that's going to need a, a quorum or will I ruin anything if I leave here? Uh, we got the quorum, Jay. We're set. We, uh, we needed four. We got six. Thank you for uh, appearing today. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's it. Well, more to come. So, um, is there any uh, any correspondence? Does anybody have anything they want to bring up? Um, any new business or anything coming forward? Uh, uh, our CEUs are going forward. Our schools are going forward. We, I believe we had a gentleman named uh, Anthony uh, Saverio, who uh, I know personally is a um, contractor in my area down shore. He wants to teach, uh, help CEC out there. I told him to uh, apply to this board so we knew uh, who was going to um, uh, uh, be a teacher. Uh, he, he holds the P1S1 and, and amongst others. Um, so I was just wondering uh, if somebody uh, had any questions in reference to uh, Mr. Severi. 
Aaron, go ahead. I, I, I it doesn't relate to Mr. Silverio. I'm okay. sorry. I mean, it might be out of line here. Um, I was referring back to our well code um, still has not been approved. Uh, it's still in limbo. And I had gotten some information that we're getting challenges to a lot of our, uh, you know, uh, protective setbacks and regulations in the geothermal code by um, a large national outside chain. Uh, and it looks like the state of Connecticut is um, entertaining their, uh, their requests. Um, and it will result in um, uh, dumbing down of our protective setbacks and codes that we set and and uh, agreed on and designed specifically to protect the uh, the groundwater and the consumers in Connecticut. So that's that's what I hear is is uh, occurring, and I've uh, I've yet to see documentation to that effect that anything has been put through. But our code still sits in limbo, um, really no no further than it ever was 10, 10 12 years ago. Okay, so Cynthia Fernandez was working on that particular piece. I believe the last we saw it was with the Attorney General. Um, so I, I would like to reach out to Cynthia and see where that stands. Richard, have you heard anything in regards to the geothermal regs? Yeah, they're, she said they're going for review. Um, hang on one second here. Let me get to my emails. Thanks for bringing it up here because I wanted to uh, find out about that as well. Last I heard, the Attorney General may have had it for the last month. That's what I heard. It's been a while. There. All right. So she sent an email to John Sima, myself, and Howard. And it was a response to John Sima's inquiry. And what was that date? Here, um, hang on. So it was on Tuesday, 419. So it was yesterday. Oh. And she said, Good morning. To follow up on the email below regarding the well drilling regulations, I want to provide I want to provide an update on the status of these regulations. The rates are scheduled to be heard on May 24th at 11 a.m. at the Legislative Regulation Review Committee. The department should have a decision of the Reg Review Committee that day as to whether they are accepted as this or rejected without prejudice. Please feel free to contact. Please feel free to follow up with me after this date for the latest update. So that's Cynthia Fernandez, our attorney. She's overseeing it. Could you send that over to me, Richard? I did get CC'd on that. I wish I had. No, nobody did. I guess it was a, her mail from, it was an email from her to Simon Weltron because it was their inquiry. Okay. So, um, Okay, after the reg meeting that we can attend, I'm sorry, Chuck. Yeah, after the reg review committee, um, then it goes to the governor's office, right, for signature. It's already been through the attorney general, then, correct? Yes. If, it, if it's going before your reg review committee, it's already been through all the hoops, except okay. for their final blessing. Okay. So a month ago, Aaron, just so you know, because that's when I followed up with Cynthia last. It was with the attorney general, um, Julianne Avalone. Uh, made sure that he had that document and that um, it was moving forward. And so we are now at the Reg Review Committee meetings and they do um, five members, I believe, of the legislature will vote on that. We have the date, 524. Um, you wanted to ask if, um, I'm not sure if, if people are there at the committee. I don't know. Uh, that's a legislative committee to vote on that, Aaron. So I'm not quite sure if I'm okay. forwarding to Aaron and you, Chuck. Cynthia's contact information. Does anybody else want it? Okay. 
Richard, could you send it out to the complete board? I think everybody yeah. needs to be um, on this so we're, we know where it's going, if you don't mind. All right. Um, and Chris, did you, um, um, and, and Aaron, I'll get back to you on the, um, on that date. Okay. I'll let you know what's going on with yeah. the revenue, uh, committees, because I don't think it's something we have to be there for. They vote on it at the legislature, um, on that date. And then, um, and then we'll know immediately, uh, Chris, you had a, a question, right? No, I didn't have a question. What I wanted to do is I wanted to make a motion that, uh, Mr. Silvio be approved as a, uh, instructor. If I'm saying his last name correct, Silverio. Uh, Silverio, I'm Silverio. Sorry. Yeah, yep. We have second a motion. Bowman, we have a second. Second. Peter, thank you. We have a second. Any discussion about Mr. Silverio? Anthony, Tony, Silverio. All in favor say aye. 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 Great. CEC is going to have a wonderful instructor, very knowledgeable man in the trade. Um, and um, knows his stuff, and he's going to bring a lot to um, young people uh, and CEU students uh, with his knowledge. And I uh, appreciate Tony volunteering to to take that step to help uh, at CEC. Um, thank you, everybody. Is there anything else anybody has for me? Otherwise, we'll ask for a, a vote to adjourn. We have a vote to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, Bye, discussion? everybody. Have a good week. Okay. So long. Karen, when you sh are you, did you shut the recording off, Karen? I'm going to do that right now. Give me one second. I have a question for you. What?